Historical Society November Educational Program. Today, our topic of discussion will center around the 19, I mean, excuse me, 1871 Nash Edgecombe County line change. Our keynote speaker is here, and his name is Lucas P. Kelly. Thank you for coming out to hear what information will be shared on this topic. And before I get started, I would like for all the famous Historical Society members to stand or raise your hands so that people will know who represents this organization. What way looks interesting. Mm -hmm. I will be serving as your mistress of ceremony, and we're going to now commence this program with a welcome and purpose from our member, Sandra Jones. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it's so good to see you all on this blustery afternoon. Thank you for being here. The purpose is printed on the back of our program. However, it is to recover, record, and promote the unique history of Edgecombe County as experienced by members of this African American community. What a noble and impactful purpose. The Phoenix Historical Society meets once a month on the second Saturday of the month at 11 o'clock at the Quigley's Building here in Tarboro. Each year, the Phoenix Historical Society sponsors an educational program in November, which brings us to our purpose for being here today. The work of the Phoenix Historical Society in the community is well documented on our website and we invite you and encourage you to look at the website for more in-depth information on the work of the Phoenix Historical Society. Most recently, the Phoenix Historical Society is responsible for seven state markers the latest one being the one erected on September 7, 2019, honoring the Rocky Mount Sanitation workers. Again, welcome here today for our November educational program. Now we will have James Ran, Vice President, to do the introduction on the podcast. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As long as I live here in Edgecombe County, we always talk about the railroad track, with the banner from Nash and Edgecombe County. They, are, they call this the steel curtain. Mm. <laughs> and, and so much. Uh, um, <coughs> racial injustice and politics have gone on around that steel curtain in terms of the schools, the funding, the tax base, and everything. So it was uh, brought to my attention through the work of a great historian named Elizabeth Balanoff, who was a student of John O. Franklin at the University of Chicago. And she wrote an article in 1972 in the North Carolina Stock Review entitled Negro Legislators um, in the uh, North Carolina General Assembly, 1868 to 1872. And in that article, she brought to light how the boundary was changed as a result of the um, uh, white supremacist counterattack to Reconstruction, Boy. to the gains. Because as you know, Edgecombe County has been a majority African population since way during slavery. You had 10,000 African enslaved people here picking cotton. 
making this one of the wealthiest counties in North Carolina. That's right. Um, at, the end, at the end of the Civil War, African Americans were freed of slavery, mm -hmm. got the right to vote in 1868, and uh, elect, started electing African Americans to the North Carolina General Assembly, County Commission, and everywhere else. Um, in 1870, there was a Ku Klux Klan terror campaign in North Carolina to, to throw back the uh, results of Reconstruction. And uh, one of the things that the next General Assembly did, which I guess you're going to go into, was, was to uh, not only remove the governor who was against the Klan, but also start moving lines to impact African American representation. So this has been an issue uh, for a number of years, and we've been, the Phoenix Society has been uh, investigating this. Um, and I've done a lot of research, and I want to thank uh, Lucas Kelly for a big tip. <laughs> He'll say, I still, I, I went and I was looking at the, the, the deeds and looking at the, the old maps and with protracted trying to figure this line, but I want to give credit to the Newberry Library of Chicago, Illinois, is one of the great research libraries in the United States who have developed this um, atlas of historical county boundaries and developed a digital file where you can go online, like right here. They, they've gone on to all the changes of the county lines through history and been able to uh, plot those lines on maps and superimpose them on the current GIS map so that we're able to now go back and see the original county line when Nash was taken out of Edgecombe in 18, I mean, 1777. The, uh, it was basically based on the falls of the tar. And uh, this line you see today is the original county line before this change in 1871 we're going to talk about. But this is where the original county line went to uh, up until 1871. Um, and you can see it, it comes right there through uh, uh, Falls of Tarp right there. So the line ran down from a place on Fishing Creek and Halifax County to the falls and then it angled a little bit to the west, going to a, a line down in what's now Wilson County. But this is important information for us in Edgecombe because to understand what was the part of Edgecombe County that was taken by this act of 1871. And I want, uh, we're going to go up the line here, and we're going to, with the help of Joseph Bocuca, our member, uh, we're going to go through this to see exactly where the old line went to. See, it came, here's Taylor's Crossroads. Here's Whitaker's over here, see everything? All of, you know, Whitaker's, Battleboro, Rocky Mountain, and Shawsburg were entirely in Edgecombe County. Okay, you see where? Now I want to point out this right here. What, anybody know what this is right here? This is Cummins Rocky Mountain Engine Plant. Mm. The, uh, the number one corporate taxpayer in Nash County now. But you see where it's sitting? Mm -hmm. That should be in Edgecombe County. Right. Let's go on down further. Now you see Battleboro. And now you see right, uh, this is Pfizer. Mm -hmm. that's, one of the big, that's the biggest employer in Rocky Mountain. And then here's Weston College. You see it comes right to the backside of Weston College. Uh, you see where the line comes? This is Western College right here. So all of Western College uh, would have been in Edgecombe County. Mm -hmm. And you keep on going down the line here. Um, and this is Hardy's Boulevard. Of course, mm -hmm. all those years that Hardy's had national headquarters right here, and then uh, the bank was there next. All that was Edgecombe County. Here, here. Now here's Rocky Mountain Mills. Here's where Rocky Mountain Mills is, which at the time was the largest taxpayer in Edgecombe County. And you know, you see what happens is if, if you're trying to, if you're elected an African American to the county commission, and the county commission is trying to do work for the people, now you take away their tax base, they can't do as much. <laughs> 
You know, we've been talking about tax, we've been talking about this for the last 148 years. Now Rocky Mountain Mills is booming, there's a big uh, uh, moon there and all that. Again, Edgecombe County, it's right off in the center here. Remember Tobacco Town, that how many, uh, from about 1900 to 1970s of the tobacco factories and plants in Rocky Mountain and what that did for Rocky Mountain's wealth. All that is right there. You see, uh, this is Happy Hill neighborhood. That would be in Edgecombe County. You go on down, go on further. <coughs> Time, I think you about right there, aren't you? Yeah. Isn't that your house right there? Yes. On the Edgecombe <coughs> County line. And then all this is Little Raleigh. Little Raleigh. You know, our distinguished former state senator, Angela Bryant. Yeah. So uh, she's a resident of what we call Occupied Edgecombe County. That's right. Okay. <laughs> going down here. But as you can see, going down here, then Sharpsburg, again, Sharpsburg, entirely Edgecombe County. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is this really makes it very real what we're dealing with, and because of what is on that that area that was taken from Edgecombe in 1871, and the tax base, you know, and why today Edgecombe County got a 95 cent on a hundred dollar tax rate versus Nash County's 57 cent, mm -hmm. and you think about the, the, all the inbound, you know, so. This is why this information is uh, important now, as we struggle now to get even more the bill on Hitchcomb County side, and it, we have it, a whole lot of opposition, even what, what uh, so far the, the, the city council has been able to do with the uh, event center, the development, uh, Joseph, and uh, working on the uh, Atlantic Avenue corridor. Yeah. Um, so anyway, anything else you want to add, Joseph? No thanks. Okay. <laughs> so we wanted y'all to see see that, and we've been able to develop a map that's in your pat in your uh, program. Uh, and this is the first uh, uh, time a map has been created that really shows this area. And again, I want to thank the Newberry Library. They were they, their, their work was critical in identifying exact uh, how that old line really ran. But that was the line as it was from when Nash County was first created until what we're going to talk about today, what happened in 1871. And um, so thank you. Uh, so now I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, I, uh, I learned about uh, Lucas Kelly through, uh, really through Bernicia Reed and worked with the Rocky Mountain Mills Project Community History Workshop because he had uh, done research on this very subject and posted an article on a website entitled The uh, Historical Origins of the 1871 Nash Edgecombe County Line. So he done, uh, we were very honored that he's come down here to share with us his research and give us more in-depth history of this county line. Lucas Kelly is uh, was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, uh, went to uh, Center College in Kentucky, and then got his master's in history at Virginia Tech. And he is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, his research focuses on interaction between Native nations and U.S. federal and state governments in the Tennessee and Cumberland River Valleys. He's especially interested in how changing notions of nationhood both facilitate native dispossession and offer a mechanism for Chickasaws and Cherokees to resist forced relocation. From 2017 to 2018, he shared a graduate research assistantship in community history and archiving with the UNC Southern Historical Collection and the Community Histories Workshop. That's what was developed in Rocky Mountain Mills. And in 2018, 2019, he was a Maynard Adams Fellow for the Public Humanities. And he's very excited and proud that in 2019, he's a recipient of the Southern Historical Association's William F. Holmes Prize for the best paper delivered at the annual meeting by a graduate student or junior faculty member. So we're very honored to have him as our speaker today. 
And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lucas Kelly. Thanks, Jim, and thank you all uh, for having me today. This is my first time in uh, Tarboro, so what a great opportunity. Uh, Jim mentioned it, it's sort of strange that my dissertation work is focusing on Native Americans, and here I am looking at uh, Civil War post-Reconstruction history. Uh, but I think that's the wonderful thing about this opportunities we have at, at UNC, is to look at um, how the contemporary connections of history st are still so relevant today. And I think that it'd be hard to find a more relevant issue uh, po in post-Civil War North Carolina that still uh, affects people today. Um, and what a, what a great opportunity to kind of unpack some of these uh, issues that are still so relevant. Um, one of the things that I, when we started this project at Rocky Mount Mill, so we were, I was part of the community histories workshop that dealt with this revitalization of Rocky Mount Mills and telling the history of the mills. Um, and it was really strange. We talked about uh, whenever we would see people uh, and talk about to former workers, even former um, administrators of the mill, they would always reference the, the line, the line change. And all of us who are from, you know, live in Chapel Hill and Raleigh, it's like, this doesn't matter. This is just the county line. It, it doesn't, it, you know, it changed. It went half a mile, in, in some cases a mile, and some other places surely isn't that big a deal. But every over and over, people kept bringing this line change up, and we started doing doing some research. And uh, one of the things we quick, quickly realized is there's so much significance of this county line that it really does matter. And has uh, it mattered in 1871 when it changed, and it mad continues to matter so much now uh, for this uh, for this blog post for this research in this project, I did a little bit of work on the contemporary significance. So I know um, some of the stuff involving the tax base, involving the school systems in Nash County and Rocky Mount, uh, but you all of course are the expert, experts on that, so maybe we can talk about that later on. Um, but again, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. My dissertation, my master's thesis dealt a little bit uh, with African American history in North Carolina. It was on black suffrage in pre-Civil War North Carolina. So this is a topic that I'm um, interested in and I thought I would study in my PhD program. That's kind of how it is, I guess. We kind of don't really choose our topic. It sort of chooses us. Um, but again, as Jim mentioned, in 1871, North Carolina legislators relocated the Nash Edgecombe boundary from the Tar River to the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad. Um, this boundary had existed in the same place since 1777, um, so nearly a century. What, what caused it? Why, uh, why did legislators favor in 1871? Um, what did Edgecombe residents think about it? And uh, how did it affect the people who were living on this border, uh, this internal border in North Carolina? Um, yeah, so as I said, as when I started investigating this county line change, people would always talk about the bridge. I'm sure that's something that you all have heard about before, the bridge. The bridge that crosses the Tar River, it's so important. Um, I, so I started out doing my research thinking that I would see the bridge more in, in my work. I really didn't find it a lot in the sources. Maybe that's something that people in, in Nash County have used to defend the, the change in the boundary. I'm not sure. Um, it's certainly true that economic issues were definitely a factor in the change in the boundary line. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it, it, it absolutely was an economic issue when the, when the line changed. But I think more importantly and certainly uh, greater significance is the racial politics um, the racial conflict that was happening after the Civil War, when pro white supremacist Democrats wanted to take power from this interracial Republican coalition that was extremely powerful um, in state politics and especially in local politics. So we talk a lot about uh, state issues. If you were living in Edgecombe County in the 1860s, in, in between 1865 and, and 1875, the Republicans, an interracial Republican alliance ran the county. Um, it happened a lot in Eastern North Carolina where it was an interracial coalition in the West. Uh, it was mostly uh, poorer white people um, who had felt uh, dispossessed by many of the wealthier slaveholder families during, during the antebellum period. So there is this moment in time when there is an interracial Republican Party that is extremely powerful. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that these white Democrats were extremely afraid of. And one of the reasons that the boundary was changed was for sure because this was a way that uh, the white Democratic Party could retake power, um, especially in the East, uh, where, um, where Republicans were, were in fact so powerful. Um, 
So let's take a little bit of background. So the the boundary line, of course, became sorry, next one too. Put that on that. Um, the boundary line became the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, and I know that you all are familiar with it here. Um, but it was built in 1840, and at the time, it was the longest railroad in the world. It was a truly a marvel of uh, of engineering. So it went from Wilmington. Uh, to Weldon, and then it connected North Carolina with markets in Richmond. It's, you can't really uh, discount how important this was. This was one of the reasons that Rocky Mountain became a viable um, a city, that it became a wealthy um, commercial place. And I think, too, many of the, the towns that are along the, the tracks developed um, because it was so important. Uh, we think about uh, the 1840s. It's a time when enslaved people were growing cotton. That cotton was so important to international economies, so how to get that cotton to other places. The railroad was the central point, so that, that allowed many of these towns to grow up in what had before for sure been a very rural place. Um, so after the Civil War, uh, or during the Civil War, one of the Union armies raided Rocky Mount because they recognized that the railroad was so important, so it is extremely significant. Uh, in, after, after the Civil War, uh, you have, as I said, an interracial Republican alliance uh, that emerges in the state of North Carolina. Um, again, it's a, a mixed race coalition between formerly enslaved people, many free people of color who were so uh, significant to North Carolina history, um, and then these um, disfranchised whites in the western part of the state who would always not, not had a whole lot in common with the, the Democratic leaders that had run the state before uh, the Civil War. Um, so a little bit of context, in 1868, North Carolina held a convention. This was the Constitutional Convention that added a lot of democracy uh, to the state for the first time. Um, before 1868, no one in North Carolina elected any county leader. So every county leader was appointed by the state governor. And so when you think about it, we, we tend to take for granted that we can elect our county commissioners today in all of our counties, but that wasn't the case. And so in the 1868 Constitutional Convention, these Republicans, um, black and white Republicans, believed that they wanted to bring democracy into the local local county level. Uh, so one of the things they did, of course, is make it uh, a part of county government that individuals could, could elect their representatives. Um, and this was extremely important. After 1868, for the first time ever, you see um, black people being elected in counties across the state of North Carolina. You have them in Edgecombe County, especially in Edgecombe County. Okay. <laughs> um, Edgecombe County especially, uh, so two, two of the first five county commissioners elected under the 1868 Constitution in Edgecombe were black, uh, and then four more African Americans were elected uh, between 1868 and 1872. Uh, in Edgecombe County, because of the large um, African American population, of course, that, well that wasn't necessarily true in, uh, in earlier times, in early other counties, but especially this isn't it's not exceptional that African Americans were in power in, in Edgecombe County. This was something that happened across many counties in East North Carolina and, and even in the Piedmont as well. Um, so he, this change is felt at the local level. Uh, it's also felt at the state level. Between 1868 and 1872, Edgecombe voters elected uh, Willis Burns, Henry Cherry, and R.M. Johnson uh, to the state legislature. They were state representatives and they were all, all three were African Americans. Um, and eventually voters in the second district, which became known as the Black Second because of the, the, the amount of power that black voters had in the district and because it was gerrymandered to allow, um, to put all the, the black voters there, um, elected John Hyman in 1875, 1877, and George White in 1897 and 1901. So these are African Americans who were in Congress, uh, who were representing the people who were in Eastern North Carolina. And these are two, so we don't have many images of the existing uh, black legislature, but here too, John Bryant of Halifax County, so he was a state representative and a state senator, and John Hyman from Warren County, who was a state senator and eventually, um, of course, became the U.S. representative. And I'm going to come back to him in a little bit. Um, so again, I want to reiterate that there was this power of an interracial Republican alliance. Um, they rewrote the state constitution in 1868, which made it much more democratic. Um, elected a majority of Republicans to the state legislature in 1868, including whites in the part, western part of the state and African Americans from the east. Um, 
two groups that had definitely been marginalized before. And William, they elected William Holden as the, the first Republican governor of North Carolina in 1868. So to understand the county line change in 1871, we absolutely must understand the success of this interracial Republican alliance and how it terrified uh, white supremacist Democrats um, that were accustomed to this aristocratic rule. Um, so, so that first effort to change the county line was in 1869. So we talk a lot about the 1871 boundary change because that was what, what uh, ultimately was, was the, the line change. Um, but this first movement in 1869 definitely was mostly based on economic issues. I, I really don't think uh, racial issues played a lot in this 1868 uh, attempt because this was introduced by a Republican legislator from, uh, named John B. Respass from Beaufort County. Is that right? Beaufort or Beaufort? Okay, Beaufort. Yeah. Um, and he wanted to make a separate county of Rocky Mountain. So we have the boundary line change in 1871. Respass and some other Republicans wanted a separate county for Rocky Mountain. And if you're a Republican in the state legislature, that would make sense. Rocky Mountain was a place where the Republican Party was so powerful. You had a lot of Eastern um, African American Republicans who were in local office, and it would give more power to this group in the state legislature. Rocky Mountain was a commercial place. Uh, Republicans in general favored a more commercial economy after the Civil War, so it would make sense that Rocky Mountain could be a viable county. And I think today you see Rocky Mountain, at the time, people recognized Rocky Mountain as differing from the rural areas of Nash and the rural areas of Edgecombe. And I think you certainly see that now. It's a different type of place uh, than, um, th than the more rural counties uh, in Nash or Edgecombe County. Um, and it makes sense too that the value of property in the state was cut in half, as one of the leading historians talks about in the state of North Carolina. Um, and so this, this first attempt in the county line change, again, uh, it was based mostly on economic issues, especially roads. Um, Edgecombe residents didn't want this. I think it would make sense that Edgecombe County recognized, of course, at the time that Rocky Mountain was so valuable. It was a valuable part of their county. They really didn't want to give it up. They especially didn't want to give it up to Nash County, but they also didn't want it to be its own separate county for local, really local interests. Um, so, oh, and again, this is the, a picture of Rocky Mountain Mills, which was right on the county boundary line. So I'm, I'm so glad Jim showed us uh, where it was because it was extremely important at the time, the largest uh, taxpayer in, in Edgecombe County. Um, so we can, yeah, go. Yeah, so the, the second attempt to change the boundary line was in the ne next late legislative session, you know, which began in the fall of 1870. Um, this proposal was what resulted in the county line change from the falls of the Char River to the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad. Um, it was introduced in the state senate by Lawrence Battle, uh, I'm sure we recognize the Battle family name uh, from doing some work um, on Rocky Mount Mills. They were the owners of, Rock this family was the owner of Rocky Mount Mills. Um, they've been a, a large, prominent uh, owner of a lot of enslaved people before the Civil War. Uh, this was really different than Rest Pass's petition. So Lawrence Battle proposed that the uh, boundary line be changed from the Falls of the Tar River to the Wilmington Ro and Weldon Railroad, unlike Rest Pass, the Republican from um, the previous session who wanted a different county. Uh, and I think, I think it's clear that this, def this attempt was for sure a, re a way for Rocky Mount Mills to be included in Nash County. The Battle family wanted Rocky Mount Mills to be in, in Nash County. William Smith Battle was the owner of Rocky Mount Mills and it paid to rebuild the bridge in 1867. So this is one of the few examples where I found something about the bridge uh, being a reason that the boundary was changed, but I just I just don't think it uh, was uh, as significant as many, as many people seem to think today. Um, and it, from the very beginning, you have this tremendous amount of opposition from Edgecombe residents. So many African Americans opposed it, and many, many white residents of Edgecombe uh, opposed as well. So I have uh, an image. This is an article. Oh, sorry, go back. Uh, this is an article from the Tarboro Southerner. Um, you know, and the editor is talking about this attempt to change the boundary line. and. Uh, he says that there needs to be this, there needs to be some good men to champion the opposition against the boundary line change. And that, uh, that nine tenths of the people of Edgecombe oppose the line. So at Edgecombe County, again, um, most people in the county uh, didn't like this boundary line change. And people listened to the, ed uh, the editor of the Charboro Southern. 
I'm going to read from a petition. You can go to the next slide. So this is a petition that Edgecombe County sent to the state legislature. And this is an image from that petition, which was signed by 174 Edgecombe residents. So this was, was, again, sent to the legislature. We, the undersigned petitioners, most respectfully beg leave to submit for your consideration that the bill introduced by the Senator from Nash to make the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad the boundary line between Edgecombe and Nash counties is, in our humble opinion, premature. And if adopted, will prove detrimental to the best interests of the citizens living and owning property in the territory proposed to be taken from Edgecombe and attached to Nash. So even at this time, there's this idea that that this territory is uh, is in Edgecombe County. It doesn't make sense to many of these people that it, that it will be included in Nash. So continuing, for a half century, the present boundary line has remained undisturbed. Several villages, namely Whitakers, Battleboro, Rocky Mount, and Joiners, have grown up on either side of the railroad and are under municipal regulations. If the railroad is made the boundary line, these towns will be cut in two, and the unanimity now existing between the citizens owning real estate will be cut asunder and the property depreciated. Besides, Edgecombe County will be deprived of a large portion of our present population and several hundred thousand dollars of taxable income. The citizens owning the real estate are opposed to making the road the boundary line and prayerfully urge the legislature to postpone the bill indefinitely. Nothing can be gained by its passage in a political sense, but great damage will be done to the citizens of Edgecombe in point of her revenue. So again, Edgecombe, Edgecombe County residents recognize that this would be a tremendous loss, tremendous loss for the county and really couldn't um, understand why the legislature was going to do this. And I think it's important to note too, this wasn't, um, this was a, a united front on the part of Edgecombe residents. The editor of the Charborough Sunday was known for spouting white, white supremacist pro propaganda at the time, and here he is agreeing that the boundary line should be changed. So it's, I think it's, it's a complicated issue when we talk about the really um, local environment. Um, so again, 150 re over 150 residents in this petition of the legislature, uh, in the House, Edgecombe's Ian e. Johnson, uh, who was a Republican and African American, led the opposition. So he, he's in the House. Uh, he's constantly fighting, um, fighting against this this proposal. Uh, Johnson wanted Edgecombe residents affected by the change to vote on the issue themselves. So he continually wants a referendum on the issue. He wants the people in this changed uh, in this region to vote on it themselves. Which makes sense. We think that this is a time when much more democracy was being uh, included at the local level. Johnson had been a champion of, of local democracy as part of this Republican opposition to democratic aristocracy. So he, he thinks that the voters themselves should have an opportunity to choose. Um, and of course, uh, the legislators who, legislators who were in favor of this change, uh, we could say, recognized that they would that referendum would have failed and that they would, the, the voters would have chosen to remain in Edgecombe County. So they refused to include Johnson's uh, petition, Josh Johnson's proposal in, uh, in the bill. Um, so legislators who were in favor of the change were afraid of democracy. We talk a lot about, or I, I mentioned that um, the state, one of the, the Republicans wanted more local power to the people. And uh, the, the white supremacist Democrats in, in uh, the state legislature did not. They were afraid of this democracy. Um, didn't, they didn't want people to decide for themselves whether they wanted the boundary line to change or not. Um, black, black state senators realized this as well, and three of them, um, alongside four other white Republicans, introduced a resolution that condemned the county line change. So it was, it was led here by John Hyman, uh, who was one of the, the African-American men who really didn't, didn't think that this, uh, this change should happen. Um, so this is the resolution that they passed. And I'm also going to read for this. I think it's really important to, to hear these, these words that um, African-American leaders were, were using to, to combat this boundary line change in 1871. Uh, so they say, we believe it is unfair for this General Assembly to pass a law that transfers a considerable portion of the territory and the inhabitants of the county of Edgecombe to the county of Nash without even submitting the question to the qualified voters. They, they wanted democracy. We regard it as one of the most extraordinary bills that has ever been passed by the General Assembly of North Carolina. It declares that the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad shall be the dividing line between the counties of Edgecombe and Nash. It will sever and divide these precincts, townships, and incorporated towns through which the railroad runs. It will create confusion and dissatisfaction among the people. 
This bill transferring a large portion of the territory is without precedent in our legislative history, and we are unwilling to sanction the perpetration of such an act of injustice and wrong upon the people of Edgecombe without allowing them at least a fair opportunity of being heard upon the subject. They also say it transfers probably more than 250 qualified voters and $400,000 of taxable property from Edgecombe to Nash. And the Senate, by, a vote, by a direct vote, positively refused to allow the question of the transfer to be submitted to the qualified voters who were thus transferred, transferred from one county to another, like stock or dumb beasts upon a farm. Mm. Think about that. Think about that comparison that they're making. They're saying this, I think that's a clear reference to, uh, to, to slavery and, and referencing that um, this was yet another example of people living on the ground who were in these communities who weren't going to have a say in uh, what this boundary was, was going was gonna to be. So again, the voters were going to be transferred from one county to another like stock or dumb beasts upon a farm. What, what powerful language. Um, but again, the, their, their resolution failed and the act passed on, yeah, the act passed on March 31st, 1871. Um, this is the act itself is printed all, all across the state. So um, again, there's no referendum. The voters themselves weren't able to decide on the issue. Uh, it's it certainly um, had a tremendous impact on on the region. And you know, we've I, I mentioned a little. I've certainly focused on the economic impact. Um, and I'm so glad that that Jim talked about the the racial issues as well. I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit more about how. That's specifically related. So in 1870, um, the Democrats retook the state legislature um, through this campaign of white supremacy. So uh, it's, it's for sure true that later on there's this campaign of violence, and that was definitely true in the 1870 election in the Piedmont part of the state. But in the eastern part of the state, the, the white supremacist Democrats recognized that, that the black Republicans were really powerful and didn't want to realize they weren't going to make any gains uh, any gains at all uh, by trying to convince um, anyone to vote for Democrats in the East. Uh, so they had to resort to these, what one historian calls subtle strategies in the legislature. So where people can, didn't really have a say in what was going on, but we had to sort of cut people uh, out of the political process. So this Edgecombe boundary, um, Edgecombe Nash boundary chain was one example. Uh, there were also another examples. Uh, the legislature also created Pender and Vance counties to give uh, white Democrats more control in the state legislature, which also happened um, after the 1870, um, in, during the 1870 legislative session. Uh, they impeached Governor Holden in 1871, and they continued to spout white supremacist rhetoric in subsequent campaigns. So this is, of course, uh, one example of this kind of rhetoric, trying to create uh, make politics all about race, which, uh, as we, as I mentioned, that the, there's an interracial Republican coalition that wasn't trying to make it about race. They were trying to work uh, across ra racial lines. And this is the kind of thing that uh, the Democrats were, were talking about. Um, uh, so the 1871 boundary line change happens. Uh, there's this moment uh, where the interracial Republican Party is so powerful that ends in 1875. Uh, there's an, a constitutional convention again, and the Democrats take local power away from the people. So in between 1868 and 1875, local residents could vote for their county commissioners. In 1875, uh, that, that process ended. And here's a, this is a cartoon, um, again, trying to, uh, to get, to destroy this interracial alliance by talking about race. So ironically, this is uh, an auction, uh, a slave auction, but it's a, this is a white person that's being auctioned off. So that's the kind of propaganda that was being used to destroy this interracial coalition. And I think it's important to talk about the population that was changed. Um, so Edgecombe County, of course, uh, is a majority African-American county. Nash County was not. So there was this idea that the local people in, uh, there wasn't, in, in Nash County, there wasn't as much reason for an interracial alliance because the, the white population was 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 greater. Um, so I think that it's important to know um, the economic issues in the local area. Of course, were were a point of concern for many people in Edgecombe County, both white and black. 
But white supremacy was what united uh, white residents of Edgecombe and Nash after the boundary line change. So of course, Edgecombe County, most people didn't like the change, but after, after the change happened, this white supremacy was what, what, united, um, what united the voters. So uh, Edgecombe County uh, no longer, Edgecombe County continued to elect African American in the state legislature and Republicans to the US House. Um, that of course didn't happen in Nash County. Nash County was always represented by uh, white, white in the local, local government as well in the state legislature. Um, just, so just because Edgecombe residents were united in opposing the new county line didn't mean they were politically, politically united or all favored racial equality. Yeah, so this is the Tarboro Southerner. I showed the other um, article where he's, he's, the editor is opposing the county line change. And this was this is immediately after the county line, and he is calling on Nash County voters to let's see. Uh, so he says there's 400 African American voters that were transferred from Edgecombe to Nash, and we expect that Nash County can take care of herself in the coming campaign. I think that's a call for for violence, uh, for a continued uh, white supremacist campaign against these African Americans that were transferred from the county. So there is the sense that. Even though the county line has changed, um, Edgecum, many, many of the Edgecum white population are, are thinking about white supremacy and that's still how they, they want to retake power from African Americans that are representing them in the local, in the local county. Um, so I, I, in my blog post, I, I finished it by doing a little bit of research on the contem continued contemporary issues. Go on the next slide. And, uh, I, you all are the experts on the contemporary issues, so I hope we can talk more about how this continuing uh, boundary line affects people this day. Uh, Edgecombe, of course, as many of you know, has a weaker tax base than Nash, and uh, there's education inequalities. The 19, 1992 merger of a Nash and Rocky Mount school districts was an extremely important issue that uh, I know there's a huge legal action that took uh, decades to, to work out. Um, and it's pretty incredible that this there's this ongoing impact of a move of the county line that happened 178 years ago. Again, how do we, when we think about history, history is in the past, but I think it's true here that history is in the present and it's still impacting everyone today. Um, so thank you for letting me speak. I'm happy to, to take any questions that you might have. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to talk about this. Construction until 1876, federal troops were in the South, whose job was, at least theoretically, to allow African Americans to vote. Do you, did you find any evidence of federal troops intervening to try to do that? So, uh, yet, <coughs> sorry. Yes, there is evidence for sure of federal troops intervening in North Carolina, uh, more in the Piedmont than in the East. So I, I touched on this. Um, Everyone knew, and Democrats knew that, that uh, Republicans were in, in power, yeah, especially in the 18, until 1876, that Republicans were gonna dominate the local, local political environment of many of the Eastern North Carolina counties. And there really wasn't a tremendous amount of violence against African Americans until after 1876, even though there weren't federal troops stationed here. I think the- But there think, was some. Th there, there were for sure some in North Carolina, but not in this part of the state, not, not as much, um, at least in, in, this, uh, in this time. There's a great digital history um, project that shows, the, it's called Occupying the South, and it shows where Union troops were occupying it. And I looked up this time period before I came down, because I thought, that was, I wanted to see if there were federal troops here enforcing, um, enforcing politic, politics working and, and nonviolent politics. Uh, but there weren't. I, I think uh, there were 100 federal troops in Raleigh in the 1870s, and there were 100 federal troops around Charlotte, and maybe some on the Virginia, North Carolina border in the western part of the state. But there weren't any here, in, around here at this time. Was there any research or look at what was the uh, investment uh, after the uh, railroad track? Uh, in Nash County versus the investment in Edgecombe County by Rocky Mount. Mm, by, uh, by the city of Rocky Mount? Yeah. So I, I'm not exactly sure on the, the, what investment happened before. It's definitely clear though that 
the, I looked up some of the, the economic impact before the line change. Edgecombe County was a relatively wealthy, wealthier place, and then after the line change, you clearly see how there's an impact on the, the county level of wealth. And I can look at the stats and, and share them for you. Yeah. <coughs> Body, especially on those types of, uh, of issues. I think the first federal census that really includes a lot of economic uh, things are in, is in 1890. Um, but no, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. But it would certainly be important to, to see if we could even see the, the direct in economic impact right after the boundary line change in, in that kind of way. Yeah, for sure. Yes. You know, Faulkner's statement about the past. It's, uh, it never, it's never it passed. passed. It's never dead. Uh -huh. It's not even passed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess when you look at the railroad track, you look at, and I don't know when the post, I know the post office was on the Nash County side at the time, at some point in time. Okay. It did relocate back on the Edgecombe County side, but I'd be interested to see how much uh, the banks and the other types of businesses that ended up on the Nash County side that forces the Edgecombe County side to actually shop in Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. on the Nash County side without having any of those reinvestments in Edgecombe County, even in Rocky Mountain. Mm -hmm. And be interested to see how much of that still exists today mm -hmm. and how long has it existed and what would be the income if we did a study of what would be the impact upon those tax bases uh, taken from Edgecombe County over its history versus on uh, what was the impact of those economic, in not having no economics in Edgecombe County. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I think Bernita, Bernita, when we've been doing this research on Rocky Mountain Mills, so many uh, employees live in Edgecombe County, uh, but they're working in Nash County at, at the mills. And even many of the employees who would have been uh, in Edgecombe County and living in, in, the, in the neighborhood or right off, away from the mill, of course, um, that, those tax dollars aren't in, in uh, Edgecombe County, just like the mills tax dollars aren't in Edgecombe County, which wouldn't have been the case if this line hadn't happened. And my last it would be amazing to say, what is the behavior of, of the population, right? Is, is there any correlation in, in the behavior of seeing Edgecombe County grow now and the same behavior of Nash County to be disturbed with that growth? Mm -hmm. is, there any, is there any correlation or, or places where that same behavior would be replicated? Mm -hmm. And my, I said it in the last one. <laughs> so, so, and so if that, if, if the, the 1871 would fail, fail, right? And then it came back and passed it. Mm -hmm. And I guess some of the process is, the other behavior is, how do we uh, make sure that we don't take the same behavior at this point? Mm -hmm. Just because we're successful in stopping something, it don't mean that we're stopping. Right, oh yeah. Hang mm -hmm. in the back. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. We have one more speaker, then we're gonna go back to questions. Oh, that works for sure, yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Love the questions, and thank you, Lucas. Very informative, very informative. Now we would have
from our community, Sue Perry Cole, who's president of NC Association of Community Development and Corporation, to speak on the same subject matter around the effects and what we're going through today. kind of dialogue. It's going to be more of an informal conversation. But before I begin, uh, let me say a couple of things. I'm trying to get these papers to stay up here. I guess I'm going to have to hold them. That's all right. So let me say this. This pattern that we see up here of one county predominantly white dominating another county predominantly black, one more economically prosperous, and one less economically prosperous. Maybe that's changing. I want you to open your minds to the fact that maybe all of this is changing. And maybe we need to have an attitude of, of change and empowerment. One of the reasons that, it, and, and Lucas opened this up, he said the contemporary situation. So let's talk about the contemporary situation. I live in Rocky Mount. I am not a native of North Carolina. I've lived here for the last 40 years, and I've lived in Edgecombe County. And I live close to downtown Rocky Mount. How many know we have a black majority on the Rocky Mount City Council? How many know we have a black majority on the Edgecombe County Commission? And that has come with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I myself was a part of the litigation that created single member districts in the city of Rocky Mountain. And that is how we got a black majority on the city council. And this black majority on the city council has been discussing issues of equity and patterns of investment and changing those patterns of investment. And just like this period that Lucas talked about in 1871, that has created a fear among certain constituencies in the city, not just in the city of Rocky Mount, but I'll, I'll say the city of Rocky Mount. And what has happened, as you know, there was an investment made, a very sizable investment in downtown Rocky Mount. How many know which side of the line that investment was made on? Edgecombe, Edgecombe County, the event center, the $40 million investment that was championed by our black majority on the city council was intentionally placed in Edgecombe County. And so then you began to see this, the tremors of this fear yep. among the power structure because see, up until this change in the composition of the county commission and the city council, Certain people have been calling the shots the whole time. Uh, an elite, financially elite, you might want to say, homogeneous, mainly white leadership had made all of the decisions in the Twin Counties area. You know that, don't you? Yes, That's why you have uneven development in the city of Rocky Mount. One, the western side of the city, the Nash side of the city, rather uh, prosperous. And then those of us that live in the Edgecombe side of the city, we're in under-resourced neighborhoods, and it's been that way for a long period of time. And just like in this period of uh, history in our, in our area and in our state, we have experienced heightened racial rhetoric, mm -hmm. almost blatant racial appeals to a, for people to identify by race. Of course, the city is majority black. I think it's about 65%, my right, population in the city is African American. So the majority of the city is black right now. And this has created a certain amount of fear and, tre and trepidation among these uh, ruling elites who control the show for so long. So this same battle for wealth, 
power and opportunity is being waged right today. And I'm standing on the side of Edgecombe County and I'm standing with the side of these under-resourced communities that it's time for a change. And a change is occurring. Some of you know that because Edgecombe County has what is called a mega site, you know what an industrial mega site is? 1,400 acre industrial complex in Kingsboro. The county has now secured, I think in the queue, already committed to somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 jobs coming to Edgecombe County. And what has been the reaction of Nash County? They've withdrawn from the Gateway Partnership because they feel that Edgecombe County is not entitled to grow this way. But it is happening. It's happening right before our very eyes. Same struggle for wealth, power, and opportunity. But you know what else is happening? A demographic shift is happening in the whole country and in our area as well. How many of you know that the trend, not only in our area but in the country, is for the emergence of a greater composition of black uh, citizens and brown citizens. That's what's going on in the country as a whole, a shift in the demographics. You saw this played out where? In Virginia, yes. which just shifted the, elect the composition of the Virginia legislature. Now they control the governor's mansion and the General Assembly. And immediately some new policies are coming before the legislature very so shortly. One of the policies will be on gun control. And they said that one of the reasons why there was that flip of the General Assembly and the taking back of these seats by the Democrats is because they had a redistricting battle. And what are we engaged in in North Carolina? Redistricting battle. So this battle continues, and it has been going on for a very long time. If I find it very interesting. I'm a Christian, I, I don't know how many of you in the room, and I believe that there's no accidents in the life of a believer. And here lately I've been pulled and pulled and pulled in the direction of historical analysis. It just so happens this week I was at the National uh, African American uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. Some of you know all of this, but I'm a dummy. I didn't know this. Do you know the basis of slavery was what? Cotton empire. And what was the biggest taxpayer that got shifted with this? The cotton mill. That was the basis of slavery. The production of cotton, which was then turned into cloth, sent up north, and some of that cloth was sold back to the southern region. That was the foundation. At the, in the museum, they call it the Cotton Empire. Mm -hmm. Cotton Empire. So you see that these forces have been in place for a very long time. And the enslavement, it was physical enslavement at one point, but now it's economic Boy. enslavement. And this is what we're battling for. But the, 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 the demographic trends cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. By somewhere in the nature of 2045, the majority of people in the state of North Carolina will be people of color. Did you know that? So we've got to get ready. We've got to get our agenda together. We should have an agenda for change. Very, very important. Not rhetoric, an agenda for change. And Jim referred to uh, this Atlantic Arlington Corridor study with Joseph and Kim and Miss Evans over here. Uh, the number of us is a community-driven uh, land use management plan. And what we are trying to do is we have empowered ourselves to come up with our own solutions to how to transfer our communities, to transform them from being low resource to be a part of the uh, vision for economic progress in our city. See, we put ourselves into the equation. We didn't ask for anybody's permission. The recommendations didn't come from the city council, they came from the people. And I'm here to tell you today that this picture is changing and we got to change our attitude. Change our attitude. It's like flipping a switch. You don't have to consider yourself less than. You can look at yourself as standing on the side of a growing movement 
And it is a growing movement in the country. That's what the battle is about. That's why the president has uh, ramped up this shop and racial rhetoric mm -hmm. of divide and conquer so that we're all at, 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 at each other's throats. That's what this is all about. But we're too smart for that because we've seen this picture before, haven't we? Yes. We've been to this movie before. Yes. We know what it's all about. We know what the script is, and how the script is written. We know what role we're supposed to play. But we can refuse to play that role, can't we? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to say just a few more things because I think the importance of today is, is dialogue and conversation. And uh, the pl uh, I did thank already those of you who planned this seminar for honoring me to come here and think that I have something to say. But let me say this, I am not an expert on boundary disputes. So I don't want to present myself to be a, just because you know something about one thing doesn't mean you know something about everything. I don't know something, a, a lot of stuff about boundary disputes. But I did a teeny little bit of research and I want to share some of that with you, particularly on the question of reparations, because that's very current right now. Let me say a little bit about that. And let me say this, too. In many ways, the black American story, particularly slavery in the post-Civil War period in particular, have never been more visible. Do you realize there's a movement all across this country for we as African Americans to reclaim our heritage? That's what, you're a part of it. This today is a part of it. All across the country, a wave of films, books, television shows, prominent artworks, historic preservation. Do you know right now the North Carolina Preservation Organization is preserving two residences that were built by former slaves? If you know where Cameron Village is, they have these properties on Oberlin Road, very close to Cameron Village, because they say these kinds of historical artifacts are disappearing and disappearing very quickly. As an aside, I will tell you in the report that Joseph is working on, we have something called a conservation district to preserve the historic black neighborhood close to downtown. Because it's almost like when I see these pictures of these black uh, men, and of course it was only men that were in the state legislatures because women couldn't vote at the time, so of course they couldn't be elected. Um, I almost hear voices talking. Mm. I hear them saying, stand up. Yeah, yeah. I stood up. Mm. Do you realize what it was like to stand up at this period in history mm. and to enact these very progressive constitutions and so forth that that our black men did, I hear their voices calling out saying, do something, stand up, carry, the, carry, carry your corner. We each have a corner to carry. They carry theirs, and now it's our turn to carry ours. But there's a resurgence, a reclaiming of African American history. Prominent examples I just told you about, Preservation North Carolina, and the restoration of the Hall and Gracefield Houses on Oberlin Road near Cameron Village, Maryland's 125-mile Harriet Tubman, Tubman Scenic Highway, Montgomery, Alabama's National Memorial for Peace and Justice. If you don't know about these things, Google them when you go home. It's very interesting what's happening. And of course, there's the National African American Museum. Cultural recognition of African American history, which has largely been hidden from public view. You know, it's been hidden. We haven't been told the truth. That's right. The truth will set you free. It's been hidden. We've been lied to. Yes, and it's coming out now. Yes, and it's empowering. And, 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 the, and in many cases, the truth was distorted to serve the interests of a financially elite ruling class. Knowing history can awaken us to our emerging new political realities associated with the shift in the nation's demographic trends which I just referred to a few minutes ago. The growing majorities of black and brown voters in many states and local communities across the country. So let me say a little bit, I've already warned you, I don't know a lot about boundary disputes, and I, I'm not here to present any easy answers. If it was easy, it would have been accomplished by now. So let me say that if you're thinking about litigation, think again. 
because it can be very expensive. I am a lawyer, but I don't recommend that we resort automatically or immediately to litigation solutions. It's costly, it's protracted, and it takes it out of the hands of the people. And I am really a person who believes in community-driven strategy. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things. So I want to start by looking at rep uh, reparations. How many have ever heard of ta Coats? You ever heard that name? And he wrote, a, he wrote a best-selling book, Between the World and Me. I don't know if you've seen that book. He is one of the major proponents. He wrote an article in 2014 in a very major magazine, The Atlantic, called The Case for Reparations. And I want to say a little bit about how ta makes his case so you can consider it. He didn't expect, when he wrote the article, for the government to make reparations anytime soon. He's a realist. Aside for an atoning for the horrors of slavery, reparations are intended to address racial inequities and the economic impact that has persisted since emancipation. This is what you've been talking about, the economic impact of this line change. Co Coates has been quoted as saying, the case I'm trying to make is, Within the lifetime of a large number of Americans in this country, it was a theft. Go ahead. You hear what I'm saying? Something was taken from us illegally. He said, according to Coates, virtually every institution with some degree of history in America, be it public or private, has a history of extracting wealth and resources out of the African American community. Go ahead. What is this example right here? Isn't it? He just proved that what ta had to say is true. The theft continued to around 1968. In other words, the point that ta is trying to make is it didn't end with the Civil War. That this theft has continued almost up until the very present. He makes the case that within the lifetime of a large number of Americans, talking about you and me now, there was a theft. And he just showed us one, but there are many, many examples of things being taken away from us, particularly, well, things of value. Uh, Coates' 2014 article became an intellectual sensation. Have you heard about it? Did you hear about his article? If you haven't read it, go read it. It was written in 2014. And it's helped change the conversation. How many know that eight of the 20 Democratic candidates are now talking about the need for a commission on reparations. He shifted the conversation, and you can shift the conversation here locally. All we got to do is get busy. Get busy. Can't sit down on this thing right now. This is, not, this is nation building time right here, right now. And you need to be a part of it, and I do too. Now, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee was a sponsor of a bill, H.R. 40, a bill to establish a commission to study reparations. Do you see the difference that black elected officials can make when they use their seat for something? These men that were in the General Assembly when and he was talking earlier, they used their voice. Sheila Jackson Lee, woman from Texas, she moved that bill. You know how long that bill had been languishing in Congress? 30 years. Couldn't move it. Couldn't move it. Well, this year, they did you know they had hearings under this bill? Yes. On reparations. Right now, you all could sponsor a public hearing on reparations. Could be informal. You could ask some elected officials to sit in and let people come and talk about what has been taken from them. Or maybe what it is that we want now, that, that, that there is economic advancement in our region. You could sponsor that. A community-driven organization could sponsor a public hearing and create a conversation and get it in the newspaper and counter these racist, racial taunts that you see written up on the front page of the Telegram every other day. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Use your voice. Use your voice. It's very powerful. Very, they don't want us to know that, but it is very powerful. In June 2019, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties held a hearing on the subject 
of reparations for the descendants of slaves in the United States. Coates was one of the witnesses, Danny Glover, you know him, the actor, very progressive activist, and Senator Cory Booker, as well as legal experts, economists, and civil rights leaders appeared at the hearing. According to Coates, the role of the commission is to document that a crime or illegal action actually occurred. See, he presented evidence that something happened. It, it just didn't get this way because somebody waved the magic wand. It was an intentional act of discrimination. Intentional. Steps were taken to make this pattern come into being. Next, the commission would need to figure out a policy for repair of the policies that were enacted to support the specific deprivation. Coates' article in 2014 basically concentrated on housing and how structural racism influenced the pattern of housing, or I should say of um, opportunity-deprived neighborhoods that we see so much that are inhabited by people of color and the poor. That's what we have in Rocky Mountain. We have 14 under-resourced, racially segregated yep. neighborhoods, many of which are located close to downtown. They didn't get that way by accident. Policies, decisions, and practices were put in place to drive that pattern and hold it in place. And what Tenahasi is saying is, yes, we must, we must prove that an illegal action took place and then we have to decide on the corrective action. How do you repair these policies that were enacted that drove this pattern of deprivation? In Rocky Mount, with the Atlantic Arlington Corridor Study, we've made a set of recommendations or proposals, not that would change our uh, neighborhoods automatically from poor to rich, but would offer some protection and way of opposing the pattern of gentrification that we see in Raleigh and, and in Durham and in Nashville and Wilmington and all of the metropolitan areas across our country. We did that as community residents. Nobody gave us permission to do it. You don't ask for permission. That's right. You just go ahead and take it and do what you have to do, just like our foreparents did. Right. What we found out once we got into this struggle is that the, some of the structures in the black community re date back to this period that we're talking about right here, mm. to Reconstruction. And some of our foreparents, the founders of Douglas Block, some of the most prominent African American residents of our city lived in this particular neighborhood. And that is the area that where we've asked for a conservation district to preserve that to a certain extent from the ball and chain that comes when developers come in and knock stuff down and put up their towers where they make all their money. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes, we had a plan. Yes, ma'am. And we asserted ourselves. And guess what? What did the city council do? They voted to approve it. That's right. Because they represent these neighborhoods. Do you see where I'm coming from? You have to have an agenda. And when you have an agenda, you ask and hold your elected leaders accountable. That's right because you're the ones that vote for them. The people that come before the city council, they don't live in our neighborhoods. They don't live in these under-resourced neighborhoods. We took responsibility because we live there, and we owe it to these gentlemen that existed in the prior century who, what, they had a vision. It's so powerful what they did. And it's so amazing what they did, the opposition they were up against. And what did they do? They kept walking. They kept walking forward. They were building institutions, historically black colleges and universities, that survive until this day. I say, I'm going to stop talking. I got a couple other things I could say. But I'm going to stop talking because the message that I want to bring to you is, what did the, what does the Bible say when Moses was, was, was there and he was praying? And what did God say to him? What's that in your hand? That's what I'm saying to you. What's in your hand? What's in your voice box? Use what you have. We are residents of Edgecombe County. It's a diamond in the rough, y'all. Right. It's coming up now. It's time. It's time. We need a vision, not of being less than, but being the powerful people that our ancestors. When you go through that African-American museum and you see it all the way from the slave ships 
through the plantations, through the segregation period, to the civil rights protests. You know what you come away with? I know what I came away with thinking. We are a powerful That's people. Right. We survived all of that. And we're not murderers. We're not going around using guns and blasting people. Well, there's a lot of gun stuff in our communities. I'll leave that alone for right now. <laughs> but we're not. No, that's right. That's right. Our spirit was shaped that's right. by a faith in a God that's right. that it was more powerful than anything mm. they were looking at every day. Mm. That's what we have to fall back on. And look at these people. Don't you hear them crying out? Can't you almost hear them saying, do something. Take action. Plan for the future. Because of them, we are where we are today. Because of them, they had the vision, they had the courage, and they took action. That's my message to you today. Be bold. Be courageous. Dream. And do something. Step out on faith. That's what they stepped out on. And look at what they did. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Sue Perry, and thank you, Lucas Hill. At this time, we're going to open up the floor for more questions and answers. Are there any questions? Okay. Yes? Uh, first is that I think is what Sue said was very powerful. I have one question and one statement. Uh, the question I have is that when Lucas was talking uh, a lot about the boundary line change, you know, it was a change from a natural barrier to an artificial barrier. Right? And it reminds me a lot of this gerrymandering that's been going around this mm -hmm. franchise us. My point is that the gerrymandering and redrawing of the district lines was very intentional, right? And very specific. And there's a lot of research going on to make sure that the, the, the Republicans get a, a you know majority and all that. My question is that what was there a history of whether that drawing of that line was intentional, that there was that research that went in there with the same kind of malice behind it. So that's the question. But I wanted to just kind of finish up with a statement that uh, first is that I, the Sue's point about economic theft and enslavement is not just national, it's international. Mm -hmm. All right, let's not forget that. So we have a lot more allies than mm -hmm. we think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not just one issue of economic equality environmental problems as well. Okay, so, so that is that, that other thing. The second is that we have to be aware that in spite of the rise in the resistance, there's also a rise in possible fascism, mm -hmm. the whiplash. Okay, mm -hmm. so what do we do about it, right? First is that I think it's very important for us to organize, empower, and to seek coalitions. Because the, the, the message of, of Trump and his ilk is that racial, what, Racial equality takes something away from white people. That's right. All right. And what I'm saying is that racial equality does not diminish white people. It does not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And white people have to realize that, in fact, there's a huge cost of privilege. And that cost is the race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. And white people are also part of that race to the bottom if they uphold white supremacy. That's right. And that's the kind of economic thing that they're blind to because of all these ideological thing that he promoted, all right, make America great again, and all this essentially right. make America white again. So I think that that point is very important for us to seek alliances, to seek coalitions, so that everybody benefits, because if we don't, right, our social wealth is going to go back to the 1%, and we're going to be stuck at the bottom again, and we cannot afford that. That's right. Yeah, so thank you for the, for the question and certainly for the comments. I think, um, and you meant, was the boundary intentionally 
designed to include a certain part of the county? Yeah, I, I think for sure. I think that the, the railroad was a convenient boundary line that was already there. Uh, this is, of course, my opinion. But the fact that it was introduced by Lawrence Battle, one of the Battle family uh, members, to it was intentionally designed to make the mills to be within Nash County. Yeah, that, that's, that's my opinion, but I think that that correlation is hard to disagree with. Like I'm moving to the railroad next time. They ain't got to have the revenue from the railroad. That's another economic thing. Mm -hmm. That you know now they get access to the railroad. Plus they had half the revenue from the railroad. And uh, if you saw the uh, the population figures that Lucas put up there, I hadn't seen them before. But Edgecombe was a very much more populous county. A large, large African American majority compared to Nash, which was a smaller white majority county. And so this, this really, the name of Nash County completely changed the dynamics for the last 148 years. And I really want to appreciate Sue Perry's tremendous uh, uh, call to action. And, and as far as reparations and even calling for public hearings, because we really didn't put this on the agenda. You know, we went through this a couple of years ago where Nash County Commission was beating up on Edgecombe over school money and all kinds of stuff. And still doing it. And one, I mean, even trying to go to the legislature to do the same thing they did in 1871 to tr draw, you know, lines to help them out. But they got the wealth over there. And they've taken this here. And uh, to your point about, uh, I think the historical record is clear that the motivation for this was an act of racial injustice to take away, to diminish the, the black vote and to take wealth away from a black majority county that now had, you know, you know the wealth and it didn't be put on the table and uh, you know uh, to the county commissioners to the c c councilman uh, Joyner. <laughs> This didn't fill a table. That we we gotta go back and say that uh, we're not forgetting this. This was something taken from Edgecombe County from the African American majority. Right. And we need some reparation. We need you know, when you talk about school money, what about all this tax money over here? I mean really it needs it, it's time for it. And maybe in terms of the growth of the African American political movement, Edgecombe and Rocky Mount, it gives them a position of strength to to even advance this. What are we going to do about this? Um, Change the conversation. <laughs> okay. I have a question on the based on my lack of knowledge on that. Like he said, when this did happen, nine-tenths of the population opposed it occurring. Mm -hmm. And it's still happening. county line change, they would have included this referendum that the African American um, Representative Johnson, Ian Johnson, wanted to include to let people vote on the whether they wanted to be in Edgecombe or Nash counties. But the fact that that wasn't included in the act shows that there was this fear of local politics, of, of democracy, essentially. Mm -hmm. And just for uh, hope of further movement on it, could I get a copy of that petition with all the yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and those I can I can I definitely like prove their Oh, absolutely. And I don't know. Um, it's un I I think it'd be incredible to look at that petition, and get the names, yeah. and see who these people were. Mm -hmm. We're gonna entertain one more question. This one will be very quick. Okay, this is the last question. Unless there's something burning or someone to 
to ask. Yes. Do you or anyone know what the racial makeup of the state legislature was in 1871? I don't know. I know that um, it was a majority Republican legislature before 1870, and then a majority Republican um, interracial, of course, party coalition in before 1870. It, it wasn't like South Carolina that had a majority black legislature. Uh, I don't think that ever, the legislature of North Carolina has ever been uh, majority black, but I don't know the exact numbers. Um, that, the article that, that Jim referenced definitely would include that, that data. The 1870 legislature was more white than 1868. That's because of the Klan. Okay. Terrorism. There's still some intimidation, voter intimidation. The in the year of 1870, Congress recorded 240 acts of Klan violence in North Carolina. And the Grand Dragon and the Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina, at that time, was buried right here in Calvary Cemetery. They William L. Saunders got a mm. marker for him right there on Main Street. Mm. They took his name off the building up in Chapel Hill, but he's right, buried right here. Mm. And when he called before Congress to question about the Ku Klux Klan, he said, I decline to answer. Mm -hmm. But they, they, and he's even got that on his tombstone over there, I decline to answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when they called Paul Robeson before Congress and asked him to remember the Communist Party, they stripped him of his passport and put it the broke the man. Yeah. But William L. Saunders is right here in, uh, right here in Tarboro. Mm. I'm box here. Okay, this will be the last question. <laughs> Due to time, we need to stay within our time limit. Is it? Should I take the mic? Yes, you can have the mic. Okay, very, very sure. Is it any different really today when local municipalities, be they cities or counties, don't have the right to change things mm. that were wrong? or institute things that are right, the legislature took that away. There is no home rule. Well, there's no referendum in next common county in this area to determine their own fate. Not a whole lot of difference. One point of recognition, I want to thank uh, uh, Reverend Thomas L. Walker and WCPS who, who ran uh, ads for this program this week as a, as a donation toward uh, this program. And we want to thank uh, the use of that and uh, their ways of support. Um, 105.7. 105.7. FM 760 AM. time that we must bring this wonderful, enlightening, educational discussion to an end. I've, it was very um, enriching. Uh, I do appreciate both speakers, Lucas and uh, Sue. You brought up very good points. And I want to end the discussion based on what Sue said. We need to open up our minds and use our voice. Mm -hmm. And we need to use our voice based on our history, which we have such documentation by individuals that they have taken that time and yoke in their life to document. And they document the facts and not their opinion. So I appreciate Lucas for documenting the facts and presenting the facts so that you can understand them. And I appreciate Sue for saying, look at the facts, open up your mind, and let's go forward and use a voice and please have an agenda. We're going to close the program. And I, I do acknowledge you, John. No. I do acknowledge you. Come on. Uh, Look at the first line on the program. That is our Facebook page. 
This program will be up at least by midnight tonight if you want to review it and spread it to your friends. All right. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have Benediction and Grace by Reverend Richard E. Joyner. But before that, we want uh, those who are here to be aware that the Phoenix Historical Society does sell literature. And Kim is at the literature table. And we try to keep our price modest. And we do have a, a couple of pamphlets on Edgecombe County. Okay. Also, for your uh, refreshment, something to give you, to give you some energy to make it to the next point on your busy schedule for today, we do have refreshment in the room beside this. And if you need to use the bathroom, there is a bathroom down the hall. So please take a few minutes and get some refreshment and take it with you if you have to. But thank you for coming. Truly, we appreciate it. You're present here. We appreciate all the questions. And please think about what was shared with you today. Think about it. Very good information. Let's give Jim and Mavis Stiff a hand. Thank you. And the culture of benediction is not that we in a process, but we dismiss into a service. Mm -hmm. So we join hands as we dismiss into a service, as we stand. And our process of standing and benediction was to say that we're ready now to carry out the service that we've been doing to us. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the power of his Holy Spirit be with us. May it keep us and provide for us and may the nourishment of that which is food and they that have labored to bring it to us. May all of us be blessed now as we go forth to speak justice and truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.